And I learned a little bit about uh, introducing one's boss this morning. So even though Les is a uh, trained as an oceanographer, I'll avoid any uh, any uh, context around ancient sea animals. I think, uh, <clears throat> but uh, Les. Uh, Les is a, uh, a vice president at Sandia National Labs. He uh, heads a very large uh, organization that, that covers programs that, that range from uh, a, a wide spectrum of energy technologies to uh, looking at uh, how we secure a reliable energy infrastructure all the way to safeguarding uh, international uh, nuclear materials. So it's a very broad perspective. Uh, Les is, uh, has made many contributions in the area of nuclear energy and uh, particularly in the area of nuclear waste management. And so it's uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Les Shepard, who will uh, chair our first panel. Well, thank you, Terry. And uh, as Congressman Hamilton mentioned this morning, there's always a risk associated with introducing your boss. In this particular case, I might even give you a raise. <laughs> What, what, Terry didn't, what Terry didn't mention is at least part of my career aspiration was to see if I could actually create a career in the high desert of New Mexico as a graduate of Texas A&M University in oceanography. <laughs> <laughs> and I can say the, the line, the queue for jobs in oceanography in New Mexico is short, and I generally find myself very close to the front. So uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, let me begin by extending my thanks to, to both Congressman Lee Hamilton and to Senator Howard Baker for their real personal leadership in bringing this workshop together. And they have invested heavily of themselves and their folks here at both institutes to make this happen. As importantly, however, I really want to recognize them for their vision and a vision to create a new approach for energy climate policy formulation that effectively includes the views and perspectives of the many diverse stakeholders in the public at large, both here and abroad, that are deeply vested in these policy outcomes. As we've heard throughout the morning, and I know that each of you today recognize the complex, highly interdependent nature of the energy climate system. And systems analysis and, mo and modeling can really serve as a vehicle to assess its many dimensions and to gain insights into its highly coupled, nonlinear, and counterintuitive nature. And it really is the shared insight and understanding, as we've heard this morning, that can increase confidence between stakeholders and diminish, if you will, the general sense of winners and losers uh, resulting from policy formulation. Systems analysis and modeling can also provide a framework of exploration and inquiry and a basis for reflection and dialogue to develop deeper shared understandings of the energy climate system and the ramifications of the energy climate system uh, to the evolving policy framework. While it's clear, as John Strauss just indicated, that science must play a vital role in forming this dialogue, in fact, it is absolutely critical it is not sufficient, and we must broadly embrace and engage the social sciences, political sciences, and others if we are to formulate an effective policy framework that accommodates the dynamic nature of this system. Today, we're really fortunate to have on our panel four individuals that are actively engaged in complex systems analysis in multiple domains as educators and as practitioners, and that contribute regularly to the policy community on these issues at the international, national, state, and local levels. It's our desire in this panel to provide a shared context and framework for the role that systems analysis and modeling can play in developing a collective understanding of the complex interdependencies of the energy and climate system, beginning with a discussion of the fundamentals of system dynamics modeling, followed by explicit examples to illustrate the application of these capabilities at the national and state level, and concluding with specific observations on effective approaches for communicating outcomes and consequences of policy decisions to a much broader community. With these objectives in mind, let me begin with a very brief introduction of our distinguished panelists. And to my immediate left is Professor John Sturman, who is the J.W. Forrester Professor of Management at the MIT Sloan School of Management and Director of MIT's Systems Dynamics Group. John's research ranges 
from the dynamics of organizational change to experimental studies assessing public understanding of global climate change, some of which you'll share with us today. Christine Poptanich currently leads the Risk Integration and Analysis Branch within the Department of Homeland Security, Infrastructure Threat and Risk Analysis Center, and in her role, she has responsibilities for understanding the risks associated with the complex interdependencies of our nation's 18 different infrastructure sectors, and I can say that is an enormous task and an enormous challenge just based on the 3 o'clock in the morning emails that I've received from job her security. regularly. <laughs> Esteban Lopez is the director of the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission that was established in 1935 to investigate, protect, conserve, and develop New Mexico's waters, including both interstate and intrastate stream systems. Esteban also serves as chairman of the Water Cabinet, created by Governor Bill Richardson in 2007, and Lance Noble, who has spent much of his career as an independent strategist and writer working at the intersection of business, geopolitics, and technology. And in 2001, Lance served as an advisor on the United Kingdom Prime Minister's Strategy Unit that examined medium and long-range strategic issues, including science, and technology policy, and energy security. And what I'd like to do is to invite John Sturman, Professor John Sturman, if he could actually share with us a brief overview of the key elements and attributes of systems analysis, tools, and capabilities. John? Love to. First, we got to get PowerPoint up on the screen instead of Windows. I have. So let's see. And, okay. This should. Okay, great. So, thank you very much, Les. And it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Senator Baker and Representative Hamilton as well for convening this group. Now. Uh, Les asked me uh, to explain system dynamics modeling, how it's used, what the tools are, not just system dynamics but all the other tools as well, and how they can be used effectively and to do it all in 10 minutes. So that's obviously impossible. Let me start instead by asking the question, well, why are you here? It's a very dangerous thing to run a conference on uh, systems approaches because it may sound to some of you in the audience as a solution looking for a question. And I assure you that's definitely not the case. There's a desperate need for systems approaches in every aspect of policymaking in government, public policy, and in corporations. And just to, uh, to illustrate, uh, when I go out and work with senior leaders and organizations, what they tell me is, sure, everybody knows things are changing faster and faster, uh, more complexity, more interaction. Uh, that's a given of our situation today. Uh, but the most thoughtful leaders, they say, look, uh, the real problem is we've never had more tools and methods to address the pressing challenges we face, and yet they still get, keep getting worse. And we have a suspicion that in many cases it's getting worse because of the way we're approaching these problems, because of the tools and methods we're currently using. So to illustrate, I brought a, a photograph of one of the senior leaders that I work with, and uh, well, here's the guy in his office. And, you know, he's like any policymaker, squeezed on all sides by interest groups and pressures, and it's impossible to move, and it's getting claustrophobic, and I can't breathe, and I gotta do something. And what you do in that situation is, boom, you lash out at the symptoms of the problem, and it gives immediate relief. The situation is now much better, but as you may suspect, there are going to be some unintended side effects. <laughs> now, <laughs> As I see some of you have been in this chair before. So <laughs> this is actually a pretty good description of the system's problem. Uh, and if you think about it for a minute, there's really no such thing as a side effect. There's just effects. You make decisions, and your decisions have a variety of effects. The ones you thought about in advance, and especially those that worked out well for you, oh, yep, that was my strategy all along. I'm a great public servant. Re-elect me or give me a bigger budget and a promotion. And everything else, especially the ones like this that feed back to flatten you, uh, that was an unintended side effect that wasn't our fault. Blame it on somebody else and give me a promotion and a bigger budget. And the, the real challenge here for those of us who are interested in helping policymakers overcome this situation is not just to understand why it happens once, but to understand why it keeps happening time and time again. Where's the learning? 
How come that doesn't happen? And if you think about some of the learning failures that arise here, there are many. Long time delays, the complexity, the limited attention that people have. He's looking out. He's not looking at his system. He can't look everywhere at once. And the mismatch between the time frame that people believe they must be evaluated over for elections or quarterly profit reviews or whatever it might be, and the time frame over which events play out. So, you know, go back to here. He actually improved things in the short run. Unfortunate, and so what's going to happen to him? Well, in most organizations, he gets promoted, and then, boom, you get to sit in the chair. So uh, there's a whole set of learning failures that create this dilemma, and what are we going to do about it? Well, you know, again, come back to, is this a set of tools that are a solution looking for a problem? The answer is no. You look around, and there is a huge array of important, highly consequential issues in which the way we're doing it now has utterly failed. We call this policy resistance. It's a situation in which the best intentions, we're not talking about malicious people or people who are working a private ideological agenda, uh, but well-intentioned people with the best tools available put into place policies that do not solve the problem or solve it only in the short run and make it work later. And there's many, many, many examples here. So healthcare, uh, I'll just put some up and you can take a look at them. Uh, there's a huge number here. Healthcare, we're obviously spending more on healthcare in the United States than any other nation in the world, but we're not anywhere near the top of the list. 34th in life expectancy, 32nd in infant mortality, 45 now, 50 million un uninsured people, epidemics of obesity and cardiovascular disease and diabetes getting worse and worse and worse. We're no, nowhere near getting the health care that we should get with that expenditure. It's a massive failure of our policies. And you can go through the rest of the list. Deregulation of the electricity markets in California in, in, around 2000 led to the highest prices for U.S. Uh, electric power in history and worse reliability, just the opposite of the intention. You suppress forest fires successfully, you get more fuel, the future fires are hotter and harder to put out. You build roads, you get more traffic congestion. Diets don't work. Uh, the war on drugs has been a miserable failure, but we have succeeded in becoming number one in incarceration in the world. Uh, and we have growing uh, antibiotic and pesticide resistance problems that uh, may render these tools useless to us in the very near future. And in the climate and energy area, uh, the absolute failure of every administration, no matter what party they're from, to reduce our dependence on imports, as Secretary Punneman mentioned this morning. This is not a new idea. Policy resistance has been recognized for thousands of years. The Greek myth of the hydra is exactly the story. You cut off one head, it grows two more. And even Thomas More in 1516 wrote that it will fall out as a complication of diseases that by applying a remedy to one sore, you provoke another, and that which removes the one ill symptom produces others. So this is an old, old idea, still not cracked. So what are we going to do about it? Well, the problem arises because complex systems have the attributes that you see here. Many of you are familiar with these. I won't go over them. Uh, but that by itself isn't the real issue. The real issue is complex systems, public policy, corporations, our families, our communities have these attributes, but our mental models, the way we think about and approach solutions, are completely ill-equipped for the task. We have short time horizons. We're, we have narrow boundaries and parochial perspectives. We don't think about feedbacks. We don't understand chance and random events or time delays or accumulation processes or nonlinearities. And the result is silos, as you see here, in our minds and in our organizations and in our policies. And uh, what we need to do is to think about the reflexive, feedback, self-creating, emergent character of these systems in which we're embedded. A slightly more formal look at this problem uh, kind of looks like this. People think it works this way, that I know what I want, that motivates my decisions, that gives me results, changes my environment. Uh, but it's not true. I commute by bicycle to my job at MIT, and every day when I'm riding down the path, I want to stay on my side so I don't hit anybody or run off the road. In order to do that, I can't just know where I want to be. I have to compare where I want to be, my goal, against where I am. I have to have the feedback loop. And that allows me to drive my bicycle down the road uh, perfectly well. The, and if governing our society or a corporation were as simple, uh, it would be easy. But it's not because we're embedded in a larger system. So there we are making our control adjustments, flying our aircraft, if you will. But our mental models are limited, and so our decisions have multiple impacts, those so-called side effects, which likely feed back in ways that we didn't anticipate, didn't want, and don't understand. Much more interesting and complex, we're not the only actors out there. 
So if we make decisions in a corporate context, for example, to boost our market share by lowering prices, introducing new products, more aggressively getting the uh, sales force out there, et cetera, we're necessarily lowering the market share of our competitors. Well, they have their own goals. We all share the same environment, and they're going to respond. You can't use policies and models in which you assume the environment is just going to continue in business as usual. All those folks, of course, have their own side effects, and, uh, and the goals themselves are, are part of the system, as any salesperson can tell you if you hit your sales quota for this quarter, management will raise it on you. So uh, if you add the fact that there's time delays in most of these links, now you just can't rely on the existing tools, the mental models uh, for uh, solving the problems. Uh, during the uh, first session, uh, one questioner said, well, why are you using models? Well, the answer to that is there is absolutely no alternative. Everybody uses models all the time for every single decision they ever make. Most of the time, it's a mental model. It could be a spreadsheet, it could be a report, but it's a model. There's no choice. The only question is, how can you choose the best model, best suited for your purpose? So what do those models look like? Well, on the technical side, effective models of complex issues are going to have certain attributes. They're going to be structural, not just correlational. They should endogenously generate the macro behavior of the system from its microstructure. They need to be dynamic models that don't assume the system is in equilibrium and respond appropriately to unanticipated shocks. They need to be behavioral. As you heard from Nick, you cannot assume that people behave rationally according to textbook economics 101. You have to capture the role of affect and emotion, social and cultural forces, as well as the economics. Uh, and you have to continually subject these models to the widest range of empirical tests, ranging from lab experiments to field studies using all sources of data and carrying out extensive sensitivity testing. And most importantly, you have to constantly strive to expand the boundary of the models. It's the interactions across the traditional boundaries, across those silos, that matters the most, not the details. Uh, and that's hard to do because there are tremendous forces out there that promote specialization in the academy and in government and in corporations. What we're looking for is to avoid this situation here where anybody who trespasses across a disciplinary boundary is told that they have no, no business being over here because you don't know anything about what we do. We need to be aggressively seeking out trespassers. Now, on the process side, even more important than those structural and substantive attributes uh, if they're going to be effective, these models have to be driven by policymaker needs, not what we pointy-headed academics think is most needed for research. Now, as a pointy-headed academic, research is absolutely vital. But if you want to have impact, it has to be driven by policy policymaker needs, developed iteratively and interactively with them, uh, engaging all the relevant stakeholders, built and run on the cycle time that's relevant to them, not the speed of academia. Uh, and relentlessly focused on implementation, but policymakers, you have to do that in a way that keeps the work grounded in the best available science and expert knowledge. Otherwise, it's just advocacy. It's not systems thinking. So there have been many, many successful applications of this, thousands and thousands of corporate applications in all areas. Uh, and just a smattering of public policy examples, these models, system dynamics models, have been used extensively and successfully in, by WHO in the polio eradication uh, campaign, where it's not only saved hundreds of millions of dollars, but saved lives. Uh, by DHS, as you're going to hear, in a variety of areas. Uh, by the CDC, in a variety of areas. Uh, by DOE and DOD, in many areas. And by the intelligence communi uh, community, uh, but I can't tell you anything about that. Um, if I have one minute or yes, so, sir, let ahead. me uh, quickly tell you about our work in climate change. Uh, I've done a lot of research that shows even highly educated people with MIT degrees don't understand the most basic concepts uh, that are relevant in the climate. This appeared in Science uh, last fall, and you can go there and read about some of these issues. Uh, and if you talk to the policymakers, so I was speaking with Christiana Figueres, who's the negotiator in the Copenhagen process, the uh, framework convention process for Costa Rica, you can read what she says here. There's a dangerous void of understanding among the negotiators uh, of the short and long-term impacts 
of the espoused unwillingness to act, meaning to uh, commit to emissions reductions on behalf of the countries that are party to the framework convention. Uh, at the recent conference in Bonn, as part of the lead up to Copenhagen, you can read this as well. The delegates complained that their heads were spinning trying to understand the science and assumptions underlying the proposals uh, put forth for emissions reduction ranges. They all seem to use different base years and assumptions. How can we make any sense of them, commented one. Well, our current climate model, which we call Sea roads uh, Climate Rapid Overview and Decision Support, is one way to try to help with this, uh, this issue. Uh, this is the screen. It, it currently represents 15 uh, countries, the major emitters and emitting, emitting regions. You can specify emissions proposals and trajectories here, including deforestation, afforestation, sequestration for each of them. And then it will tell you what might be the likely outcome in terms of concentrations in the atmosphere, likely temperatures going forward to 2100, sea level rise, et cetera. I don't have time to show you the model, but the goal is to improve understanding among these three key groups, policymakers, educators, and the general public. Uh, as Secretary Pondman uh, mentioned, uh, and as Nick clearly illustrated, if the public doesn't understand the core elements of how this works, it doesn't matter how good the science advice provided to the policymakers will be, because the policymakers will never be able to get the legislation or the treaties enacted to be consistent with the science. So all three of these groups must be involved in the debate and in the education process, and it's not really that different um, among them. Uh, so in order to do this, this model simulates in less than a second, runs on a laptop, has an intuitive interface. All the assumptions are open and easily examined by clicking through and seeing what's going on. And the full technical documentation is posted on our website, so you can all go there and see all the assumptions. And it's carefully grounded in and consistent with the accepted client science, including what's in AR4 uh, and, uh, and other more recent studies. And it's been subjected to uh, peer review, expert review by a panel of... Uh, distinguished climate scientists, and you can find their report on our website as well. So how is this model being used by policymakers? Well, I can't tell you everything about it, but for example, uh, it, at the Bonn conference in Germany in uh, April, Jonathan Pershing, who's the number two person in the State Department on climate policy, gave a plenary talk in which he used our model, uh, and you can see uh, this is his actual slide, uh, to uh, present all the currently known at that time publicly available proposals that countries were making for what they were proposing to commit to in Copenhagen for emissions reductions. And you can see different base years, different metrics. It's sometimes emissions, sometimes it's emissions per capita, sometimes it's emissions uh, intensity, meaning per dollar, carbon per dollar of real GDP, uh, different years, uh, deforestation, car uh, fossil fuel combustion, et cetera. Very hard to aggregate these up. Well, it's trivial to do that in our model. And if you do that, what you find is that the blue line, which is the A1 FI or business as usual scenario, which gets us to about 920 parts per million CO2 by 2100 and about 5 degrees C warming with some band around that, but clearly a very bad situation. Uh, it's better, but we're nowhere near uh, where we need to be to limit the risk from, uh, from climate change, limit the risk of the, quote, dangerous anthropogenic interference that we're all committed to avoid under the Framework Convention Treaty. Uh, so much, much more work needs to be done, and they are now currently using that model to negotiate with the other parties, EU, China, India, et cetera. Let me just wrap up with one final thought for you. If these tools, not just this tool, but any of these system tools are going to be effective, you have to use them in what I call the reflective mode, not the protective mode. Unfortunately, and as many of you know from your time in, in Washington and in business, most of the time models are used in a protective mode. They're used to prove a pre-selected point, keep your assumptions hidden, uh, use the data that only buttress your position and cover up everything else. And it's designed to promote your authority as a modeler and an analyst and make the policymaker dependent on you. That does not work. It seems like it works in the short run, but just like pushing down the domino, it ultimately fails. Effective use of these tools has to be in a reflective mode that's designed as a genuine inquiry process that exposes our hidden assumptions and improves our mental models, that motivates the widest range of empirical tests, challenging our preconceptions and preselected policies, exposing our biases, and ultimately being in the service of empowering the policymakers and enhancing their capabilities. That's the only way any of this stuff ever sticks and makes a genuine difference. Thanks a lot. John, thank you.
I, I, would, I would also comment that one, I know there will be a number of questions follow on relative to your model, uh, but at the same time I sense I could have used some of that modeling capability to plan this session. It is truly a complex interactive system. And with that, let me move to Christine. And Christine, uh, as I indicated in your introductions, um, you are really actively engaged in assessing risks of significant importance for this country in a variety of different venues, uh, not only in this country but around the world. I think it would really be worthwhile for this group to really hear some of your experiences, uh, how they are relevant to perhaps this, this broader uh, topic of discussion on policy formulation. Well, it's funny because when I was trying to prepare my remarks the other day and I was thinking about what I was going to talk about, I was trying to think through climate change and how I was going to talk about what we were doing. And actually, I had a scenario just the other day that helped me kind of crystallize how I was going to start this conversation with you. Realistically, we have 18 critical infrastructure sectors that have been defined for the country. And it's our job within the Homeland Infrastructure Threat and Risk Analysis Center, HITRAC, to assess the risk to those sectors. And we assess those risks for the very specific purpose of setting priorities, setting resource allocations, deciding where the government should focus its limited time and attention and resources to get the maximum use. And we do do a lot of thinking about the unintended consequences, and we've seen a lot of those in our work. So we try to avoid them. But the other day I was seeing, and we were talking about the greatest risk to the nation's infrastructure. And we were having a conversation, and I mentioned climate change as a major risk that we need to start looking at more in a concerted fashion, we need to spend a lot more time with it. And somebody who was around the table said, well, why would climate change has nothing to do with infrastructure? <laughs> okay. So education of leadership is um, a key, key thing that we do. Risk communication is key. Helping people understand the interconnectedness of these systems. When the department first stood up, the view of infrastructure was very much brick and mortar. It was individual assets. We weren't thinking about systems. Nobody was talking about systems. And we've had to learn the hard way. We've learned through things like hurricanes hitting. We've learned through things like, to use the most recent example, banking and finance. Everyone said, well, banking and finance, terrorists can't take them down. You take down any given bank, and you're not going to take down the system. Business practices, ooh. There's a vulnerability for systems. So looking at these from a systemic standpoint, we really have had a sea change in our understanding of infrastructure going from this very brick and mortar understanding to a systems based. That has come with a lot of challenges in and of itself because systems analysis is not easy to do. We have a very, very big mission when you look across all these 18 infrastructure sectors. So I'm talking everything from agriculture and food, banking and finance, commercial facilities, chemical facilities, energy, government facilities, national monuments and icons, water facilities. All of this is the nation's infrastructure. It really is the backbone to our way of life. And we're supposed to, with my little staff, figure out what are the greatest risks and where should we be focusing as a nation. So it's a real challenge. Some of the ways that we use system analysis, we use it in a lot of our different programs. So one of our programs is called the Critical Foreign Dependencies Initiative. And it is designed to identify those things that we get from overseas, like, oh, I don't know, energy, that we're critically dependent upon. There's a lot of things other than energy, though. And it's good that this group is focusing on energy, but that is not the only foreign dependency that we have. So we have a program that's specifically dedicated and focused on identifying those things before they become critical. The whole idea is don't let it get to the point of energy. Don't let it get to this point that we're in right now where it's a crisis. Start to identify these foreign dependencies. Start to identify strategies. Use system analysis to make sure we don't have a little un unintended consequences, but really start to get proactive in shaping that risk landscape. We have another program called the Long Range Planning and Analysis Program, which is designed to look 30 years out. It's designed to look at those future risks that we're going to face. So again, that we don't get behind the curve. Again, systems analysis is a key portion of that. So we use system analysis really in three kinds of different ways. One is to help us set priorities, because realistically, we do have to look across the breadth of the nation's infrastructure and all the hazards that are facing it and figure out where we as a federal government are going to focus our time and attention. And there's really two problems that we face when we look at it, um, look at this broad horizon. One is time, and we really take the model simple, think complex approach in the sense that we don't have a tremendous amount of time. And in fact, most times when we're reacting in a reactionary posture, we have very, very little time. So we have to do things quickly. And then the second is integration. And it's kind of um, one of these challenges that we're only starting to really talk about as a department, which is it's fine if I come up with a solution. I have my all my analysts. They do their work, and they come up with a solution. And then you come up with your solution. And then we present all our solutions to decision makers. That puts the decision maker in the position of being an analyst. And they're 
they're not, they don't have the time to do that. So really another thing that we're focusing on is the integration and making sure that we're not just doing this type of analysis, which is complex in and of itself. What we, we don't want to do is push all this complex analysis up to our decision makers, educate them on our narrow perspective, and then ask them to decide across the breadth of choices that they have to make and the breadth of issues that they have to face. So really looking at the integration. The second major area that we use systems analysis really is developing the strategies because it's not just good enough and I'm constantly telling everyone this it's not good enough just to tell you what the highest risks are that's like telling you that you know there's a problem well I'm a little more solutions oriented and the department is as well so really we're trying to push forward with what are the solutions to those problems and in doing that kind of development that really is something where where systems analysis a whole bunch of other different types of analysis come into play really what we're trying to do is not just look for one solution one model one answer we're trying to look across the breadth of models and analytic approaches available to us use them all because then you get some really interesting findings. Sometimes you'll have two different models that take two slightly different perspectives. They'll come up with different answers. In which case, you know you've got to look at that issue a lot more, a lot deeper. Sometimes you'll have different models that come in and they agree with each other. And then you have a slightly a greater degree of certainty in kind of the answers. The third major way that we use systems analysis really is to identify stakeholders that otherwise we would not necessarily have thought of. And that's important both from the impact of those strategies, but also in terms of helping champion strategies. Sometimes we can go to a stakeholder group that didn't know that, did not, because they have kind of a collective action problem, didn't necessarily understand the stake that they had to play in a larger issue. And so we were able to use systems analysis to identify some of the key stakeholders that we otherwise wouldn't be able to work with. And of course, looking at unintended consequences, we do try to make sure that we're doing more good than harm. The challenges that we face and the reason that we come to, con to conferences such as this and we try to talk to as many partners as we can is because we do face challenges. The fact is, is the state of the art in science has not kept up with where our decision makers are and the where, what they need to be able to answer. Some of the challenges we use are related to time. It is great to come up with a complex model, complex approach, complex analytic process, but most of the answers that we have to come up with are fast, fast answers, and that fast can be relative. So coming up with answers on what we need to focus on as a nation out to the year 2030, fast may be a couple months so we may have a little more time. FAST may be in many cases 12 hours, 8 hours. So we can't be relying upon models that take forever to run, to you know, processes that take forever to execute. We have to be able to do it quickly. The second thing is usable. I would love, love, love if every journal would include a section about, from our perspective, how useful some of these ideas are. I understand that a lot of the ideas in journals are foundational and they're designed to inform the ultimate development of products, but there's a lot of solutions out there that simply don't reflect what our requirements are, they don't reflect our operational environment. It goes back to the whole, you know, if you walk a mile in my shoes, you might develop a slightly different approach. And that's kind of what we want to start to develop is a stronger partnership so there's a better dialogue about what we need. The final challenge we really are having is, um, it's, it's a challenge, talking about uncertainty, talking about risk tolerance. And that's been a huge issue because nobody wants to, going back to some of the comments that I couldn't make as a government official, but the concept that there is a need to talk about risk tolerance. We talk a lot to our partners about the fact that they use risk and hazard as synonymous. Risks are choices. You take risks. We as a country take risks. We choose to prioritize because we can't focus on everything. Those are risks that we take. And being cognizant of those risks help to prevent some of those unintended consequences. If you're talking about those potential issues down the line, you can go ahead and have the dialogue, do the analysis, be informed. And that's been a real challenge, is talking about risk tolerance, talking about uncertainty. Um, it's very, very easy for an analyst or a modeler or you know, someone in the academic community to say that there's a 20% you know, uncertainty with this decision. If that's your job, if you're wrong, if that's American lives, if you're wrong, that 20% takes on a whole different meaning. 5% takes on a whole different meaning. So those uncertainty bans take on a very different meaning for our leadership and it makes risk communication a real challenge and something that we continue to, str to struggle with. So those are kind of, very quickly, the broad of what we do, some of the ways that we use it and some of the challenges we face. And um, we actually, for anybody who's sitting there thinking, well, I have a solution, you know, a lot of people have those. For anybody who's sitting there thinking, I have an idea, we have an email address that goes to our entire branch. We're always looking for partners, for people who are thinking things, have written articles, who have thought about these things. That email address is risk, R-I-S-K, at hq.dhs.gov. 
Again, that's risk at hq.dhs.gov. And we're always happy to hear from the community because these are issues like the foreign dependencies, like the energy, like the climate. We rely upon a larger community to help us get the knowledge that we need to inform our decision makers. So we see you as important partners. Thank you, Christine. That was, that was really an excellent systematic summary of a systematic approach that's being adopted by Department of Homeland Security, at least within your, within your organization, it helps build confidence. One of the topics I'd really like to come back to, you alluded to it many times, is this whole notion of decision making, integration, and of course the uncertainty question, which really arose earlier today uh, as a result of an earlier presentation. If Senator Pete Domenici were here today, uh, what he would say and he was always fond of saying this in New Mexico, mi casa es su casa, mi agua es mi agua. <laughs> he said it often. Esteban actually sits in the midst of the water issues in New Mexico in many different ways. Uh, he is actively engaged and has been for many years now in the Middle Rio Grande Endangered Species Collaborative Program. Uh, he's engaged with a number of very diverse stakeholders, and referring back to a slide that John showed, trespassers will be shot, survivors will be shot again in New Mexico, that's very real. Uh, but he's engaged with a number of issues around endangered species, the Rio Grande Silvery Minnow, the Willow Flycatcher, as well as growing demands for water resources in the most rapidly part, growing part of New Mexico. He's got many, many experiences, some of which are really good, some of which perhaps he'd like to modify, and we've asked him to share some of those experiences with us. Esteban? Thanks, Les. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Les just gave my, my, my talk, so I don't have to really say much. Uh, actually, I was, um, I was invited, I guess, as a practitioner of systems analysis, uh, not necessarily in the energy arena, certainly not directly anyway, uh, but uh, definitely indirectly. Um, so New Mexico, um, as, as was stated in my introduction, the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission is charged broadly with doing all things necessary to investigate, protect, conserve, and uh, develop the waters of the state. And uh, in the middle Rio Grande, well, New Mexico, if any of you have ever been there, New Mexico is quite hydrologically challenged. <laughs> and and um, the, uh, middle, the middle valley of the Rio Grande is... Um, the fastest growing of a of a growing state and where the half of the state's population is right now it's a highly managed stretch of river with a, a number of dams that have been installed on river the the river is laterally constrained by levees um, oftentimes the entire flow of the river is uh, diverted right out of the river and there's an ever increasing demand on on that river um, so given that all of the water is already spoken for, it basically re it calls for a reallocation of the, the water that, that is available. And it's a highly variable supply of water. So variable, in fact, that the lower end of the middle, uh, middle Rio Grande has been referred to as the area where New Mexico spreads its water to dry. And it, it's, it's quite true. The, 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 um, the river uh, often will completely dry up on the lower end of the Middle, middle Rio Grande. Uh, all of those things conspired uh, to create a, an endangered species issue in 1995. The uh, southwest willow flycatcher, uh, a bird that's dependent on riparian habitats, and, and the Rio Grande silvery minnow were listed as endangered. And um, obviously a huge amount of conflict and, and litigation ensued. In 2001, in the, in the middle of uh, one of the worst droughts that we've experienced to date, uh, the court, in, as a result of the litigation that was ongoing, ordered the release of uh, something on the order of two th uh, 200,000 acre feet of, of water to keep the river wet at the lower end of the, the Mil Rio Grande. Um, not really knowing exactly what was needed for the fish, but that seemed like the right thing to do. Um, 200,000 uh, 200, acre feet of water may not seem like a lot of water if you're sitting in Washington, D.C., but in New Mexico, in the Middle Valley, that's a huge amount of water and, and water that a lot of people are dependent on. So in order to, to manage some of this um, conflict and try and bring some more sustainable solutions um, to help preserve the, the imperiled species and, and also um, 
just some of the existing and planned future water uses, um, there a, a stakeholder process was convened. It, it is known now as the Mill Rio Grande Endangered Species Collaborative Program. It's an open stakeholder process. Basically, anyone that wants to come in is welcome to come in and, and participate in this. I'm going to describe some of the stakeholder entities and some of their interests just to, to give you an, an idea of how diverse it is. First of all, the, the Pueblos, the Indian or Native American Pueblos. Um, Pueblo is the Spanish word for village, and these Pueblos have been uh, in their same location since pre-Columbian pre -Columbian times and used water for uh, uh, farming and traditional and religious uses. Uh, it's really um, an, an additional complexity in that is that all of these Pueblos have at least some uh, level of sovereignty in, in terms of dealing with the state. Um, there's all of the non-Indian farmers in the area who um, rely on the water for their own crop production, their livelihoods. There's environmentalists that, um, you know, I, for, at least from my perspective, I, I look at uh, this category as uh, pretty diverse in and of itself. Uh, there's certainly en environmentalists who I think have the um, the sustainability of the ecology as one of their primary drivers, and there's others who I think use um, use that as perhaps driving other ends, for example, population control, trying to limit additional growth. There's municipalities and municipal utilities that are uh, going to supply water to all their users and uh, for, for whom their e the economic growth is completely dependent. The Mil Rio, uh, Mil Rio Grande Conservancy District is the uh, organizational or the, the local government that uh, provides the water to the irrigators and also makes sure that the fields are drained. There's a number of state agencies involved in this. The, the uh, Interstate Stream Commission, which I'm the director of, um, the Department of Game and Fish has a strong interest in fish, although sometimes it's um, sports fish. Some of these sports fish love to eat these endangered uh, silvery minnows. Um, the New Mexico Attorney General's office, um, they've certainly gotten involved in all of the litigation activities that are going on. The Ag Department um, certainly wants to support its farmers. And UNM, uh, as a, the University of New Mexico, as a research institution, wants to help craft a solution. And there's federal agencies. There's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They're responsible for regulation of the Endangered Species Act. The U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, they own the irrigation project, the dams, the some of the levees, the diversion structures, and as a result of being the entity that, can, that controls the gates on those things, they have specific ESA responsibilities. The U.S. Corps of Engineers, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, they have uh, flood control dams, levees, and again, they have specific ESA responsibilities. The Bureau of Indian Affairs, they have trust responsibilities to the Pueblos, including uh, caring for the Pueblos' waters and lands, and et cetera. And we have a lot of what I would uh, term passive stakeholders or observers. We have the, the states of Colorado and Texas, with whom we share the river under the Rio Grande Compact. Uh, the nation of Mexico, with whom we share the river under the treaty. And um, so... All of these entities, in some form or another, are part of this collaborative program. It's certainly a diverse group of um, technical uh, interests that are involved. There's politicians, there's engineers, hydrologists, biologists, lawyers, uh, geomorphologists, um, and river runners, uh, people that like to watch birds, etc. Um, so the, the goals of the collaborative program are pretty much what I described earlier. That is... Just generally speaking, do good things for the fish, but do it in such a way that uh, you preserve the viability of existing and planned future water use. So we're trying to find sustainable solutions. And in trying to find those solutions, we've certainly used a lot of um, simulations, uh, computer simulations, models, um, surface water flow models, um, modeling the river operations. That is, what happens when you release water out of a dam and it flows 200 miles before it gets to the critical habitat area. How much of that water is going to actually still be in the stream in a desert environment? Um, we have intera interactive um, groundwater flow flow models to to show just how much water is going to be coming out of the stream or uh, coming into the stream in, in that intervening reach. Um, 
the, there's a, a number of our successes in terms of the collaborative process is probably specifically drew, due to the ability that we've uh, been able to develop those and use those models. Some of those successes, um, first of all, we've agreed upon as, as a collaborative program, and uh, uh, this is part of a, a biological opinion, we've agreed upon minimum flow targets uh, in 2003, and um, we've been able to meet those minimum flow targets. The fish is doing better than it has been, than it's done ever since it was listed in 1995. So I would deem that a success. We've, uh, the Mill Rio Grande Conservancy District has dramatically reduced their diversions and they're still meeting all their farmers' needs. And we've an increased the focus on upstream habitats and areas that are uh, norm normally more wet. We've had other, other models that have as yet um, yielded less success. Uh, recently we've uh, begun work on a population viability analysis. This is a stochastic bio biological model saying if, uh, if we do certain things, um, certain actions, what's the effect on the fish population going to be? And, and um, we've tried to link the outputs of those models to the hydrology models. So far we've not done a very good job and in fact I think it's um, it hasn't been successful in large part because there's not agreement on the assumptions that go into these, the data that go into them, but I think it's at least um, an area that we can continue to work on and I think that will yield future successes. We have some decision support models to, to try and address uh, quickly the, the um, just short-term decisions, basically uh, a, a slider, slider uh, be able to modify a variable and see exactly what the impact of that is. So far, those haven't reached uh, as much success as we'd like simply because they're not as refined as we'd like. We have uh, better tools that take longer to run. Those, those are the ones that have been most successful so far. Um, certainly, we're going to become more involved in trying to assess the climate variability and how that affects uh, precipitation and runoff forecasts and so forth. So far, I don't think we have confidence in the, the models, the, the scale that the, the, uh, those models exist in today aren't really particularly useful for us yet. There's an awful lot of issues, and I, and I found uh, Mr. Maybe's uh, comments regarding the, the relationship between corrections and fish. Uh, I thought those were interesting. In New Mexico, we have a fish mafia, <laughs> and, and that's basically the, uh, there's um, a lot of turf in terms of uh, who controls data, who controls the science, who, who gets to decide what studies can be done. Um, often the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Game and Fish are very, very uh, protective of their roles in that. And um, I also found Mr. Maybe's uh, uh, comments on incentives uh, and uh, feedbacks particularly interesting. Uh, certainly there's a perception that um, the agencies, the federal agencies, and I'm sure that it's per the perceptions are the same about our state agencies, uh, are in this for their own ends, often just to, to gain operating, uh, operating dollars and not necessarily to find a solution to the, to the problems. Um, and there's part of that may be a problem with um, regulatory feedback. Uh, the, the regulators really, they just set criteria that has to be met. They are not on the hook for anything themselves. So anyway, I um, thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to questions and discussion later. Thank you. Esteban, you, you've laid out really a, a very complex set of stakeholder interactions, and for those of us who live in New Mexico, we can really appreciate what that, how that uh, actually manifests itself in many ways. Uh, Lance Noble has, has been actively engaged in working on what I would consider the wicked problems uh, of the world, if you will, in, in many cases, and has been involved in communicating outcomes uh, and consequences of complex systems analysis with a variety of different stakeholders uh, with different worldly views. And I think, Lance, you're going to allude to some of those uh, case studies as well. Okay, th thanks very much, Les. Um, I'm going to talk about two things, really. One is how systems thinking relates to narrative and the importance of that. And then also, as Les, Les mentioned, the sort of notion of wicked problems. Um, Nick earlier uh, used the pithy Keynes and Oliver Wendell Holmes quotes, but I uh, uh, H.L. Mencken uh, also looked at, at these issues, and uh, he said, for every complex problem, 
there's a solution that is simple, neat, and wrong. Um, so, you know, one of the things I think we're all grappling with, with climate change uh, and energy issues in particular, is the tension between the complexity of the issues and the need for simplicity in terms of providing a narrative that policymakers can understand, that the public can understand, that can can galvanize support for the change that I suspect most of the people in this room recognize is necessary. Um, I became involved in, in some of these issues um, when what's now called the Strategy Unit was being created in 2001. Uh, and the person who was the director of it at the time, Jeff Mulgan, um, he brought me in because he wanted to have somebody who was involved in the strategy unit um, who would help shape the narrative. Um, and Nick tells me this is now uh, a sort of mantra that everyone talks about, but the notion of taking you know, big, thick white papers or policy reports or whatever they might be and actually having a narrative that's evident and that can be persuasive was, was a relatively new notion. And one of the things I think I found is the power of systems thinking um, is, as some of what John showed, is evident in its ability to unpick a problem and begin to um, illustrate the interactions and the feedbacks and the feed forward loops and all of those things. But it's also in terms of its power to provide a uh, a visual picture of what's going on. And it's interesting, just even sitting here in this room today, um, you know, you look at the failed state diagram that Nick showed this morning, um, which was relatively simple. And, you know, I'm sure there was an enormous amount that went into creating that simple diagram. But by having that simple visual reference that arose out of a systems approach, I think it becomes a very powerful tool for persuading policymakers that here is an effective approach. Because we don't always think, I mean, we, we all have different cognitive ways we approach issues and problems. And the reality in policymaking circles and in government is the cognitive pr approach that's favored is a purely literary one. Um, long pages of legislation. Uh, complex PowerPoint presentations with lots of bullet points. Um, you know, we're all familiar with those methods of providing uh, a path to understanding. But actually, many of us think very effectively in visual ways. And part of the power of a systems approach is it can make evident that visual effect. Um, you know, it's interesting, John's cartoon of the uh, I don't know whether they're stone or concrete dominoes or whatever that that man's going to be crushed by. Um, you, that got an instant reaction here, and everyone understood instantly um, you know, the point John was making about unintended consequences. Because it was in, if he could have had five bullet points that maybe said the same thing, but it was the instant visual recognition that actually gave us the understanding. Um, by coincidence, on, on Monday, um, Bob Carell, who I guess was your collaborator on, on Sea Roads, John, I, I saw a, a briefing by him in San Francisco and, and had a chance to look into the Sea Roads um, simulation um, in more detail. And to me, that's the ideal demonstration of some of the potential that the systems approach can provide. Because, you know, as you saw in some of the slides John gave, what Sea Roads enables in a very simple way is it, it I mean I don't think this was shown on your slide but you have a, a set of sliders um, at the bottom of the screen and you can say okay I'm going to assume you know that we have a higher um, goal for Japan or the afforestation is bigger than that or whatever the variables may be and you can instantly then click the button and see what happens to that carbon graph. And so there's an instant feedback and a visual representation, which I think is so powerful. Christine mentioned the difficulty of you know, ha having someone say, I don't understand what's the relationship between climate change and infrastructure. Um, the White House issued a report on Tuesday, the, the results of the US Global 
climate change research program. And there's uh, a map in the report, um, at least in the version I saw, which looks at the area between sort of Houston and, and New Orleans and what will happen with a relatively modest sea level rise later in this century to that area. And a staggering percentage of that area is underwater. And that area also, as Christine I'm sure is acutely aware, is where a very significant percentage of the US oil refining capacity is. Um, it's also some I don't know, 680 miles of highways and railroads that connect most of the southern United States go through that area. So if you want people to understand, okay, we've done all this modeling, there are formulas behind it, whatever, but in terms of achieving understanding, you can show one map, and I think you have a very powerful lever for understanding. The other point I want to make um, is the notion of wicked problems. And I think many of you may have heard this phrase. Um, the notion of wicked problems arose in the 60s um, out of um, people who studied planning. Um, two men, Horst Rittel and Melvin Weber, um, really developed the idea. And I think there's a lot in the literature and in the understanding that's developed about understanding and working with wicked problems that relates to a lot of what we're talking here about systems thinking and problems that um, where systems become very valuable. And just to give you a very brief introduction, wicked problems are in contrast to tame problems. Um, they're complex, they're open-ended, they're ambiguous. And here's, I think, the critical point in, in the energy climate debate. They have multiple stakeholders who have different and often irreconcilable perspectives. <coughs> One of the things that the people that study wicked problems in, in the social sciences and the like have concluded is that a critical aspect in arriving at a solution for a wicked problem is you need to bring all the stakeholders together and under one roof. And you know, if, if there's anything, you know, part of the design of these two days is about understanding a systems approach, but it's also about, you know, if you look at the title of this conference, it's about an open and transparent process. And I think the power of that is if we're going to achieve an effective low carbon policy in this country and for the world, we're going to have to find ways, because it's about the most wicked of wicked problems out there. We're going to have to find ways to bring all the stakeholders under one roof to galvanize people, to get people to see the ir irreconcilable perspe perspectives and deal with them and understand each other and move forward on the basis of arriving at a better common understanding, because certainly we have people who have no understanding um, at the moment of, of where other people are. Um, so the visual power of systems thinking, its relation to wicked problems, you know, I think there's something there that can be very powerful in advancing a much better policy process um, in Washington and even more broadly across the globe. Thank you, Lance. So let me say thanks uh, for providing really a, a framework for a very rich, I think, dialogue-filled discussion overall. I, I actually, as, as the microphones start to move around the room, uh, I'm going to invite the audience to, to ask their questions. But I'd, I'd really like to start out with one that really wasn't discussed too much during the course of the four presentations, but was alluded to a little bit today. And it really talks about advances in the state of the art, in the state of science between the gaps in our decision-making analysis today and, and really what it is decision-makers need and how can we fill those gaps and how should we be investing in those. And I'll turn that over to John to begin with, if you don't mind. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so it is true, as several other speakers mentioned in the morning, that there's a need for advancement in the tools, in, in the modeling tools, in the analytical tools. Uh, but I'd actually like to take a somewhat contrary view. We actually know an awful lot that's uh, of high potential utility right now today. 
uh, because the mental models that many people, not just policymakers, but the general public, highly educated folks, even in academia, uh, my own students and colleagues in many cases, the mental models that we're using are just atrociously horrible. So in the climate work, we have done experiments that demonstrate that uh, many people, and by people I mean MIT students, so far more highly educated than the typical member of the general public. That doesn't mean they're better, it just means they've had a lot more formal schooling and mathematics training, including calculus, differential equations, and all the tools that they are supposed to know and that are relevant to answering the question. They cannot tell you what the relationship is, even qualitatively, between emissions of carbon dioxide, removal of carbon dioxide from the uh, atmosphere, and the concentration in the atmosphere. Well, this is no different in principle than filling up a bathtub. Everybody knows that if you pour water into your bathtub faster than it drains out, the level of water in the tub is going to rise. Well, what m the majority of people tell us in the experiments, and we've asked the question every which way, so it's not an artifact of how you frame it, uh, is that uh, we can stabilize the climate just by stopping the growth of emissions even though emissions are currently twice as high as the removal rate and are going to remain higher under that scenario. In other words, they're telling us that we can fill our bathtubs twice as fast as the water is draining out, and yet the level of water in the tub will stay constant. Well, this violates conservation of mass. The most basic principle of physics there is, and one that every one of the people I've run this experiment with has been exposed to multiple times. So it isn't a question of we need better agent-based models, although I, I think we, we, we can benefit from that. I've used them myself. It isn't a question of we need better statistical tools. We need all that stuff. That basic research in better modeling tools is essential. But that's actually not the bottleneck to progress. The bottleneck to progress is the softer technologies, if you will, of how do you get what we already know presented interacting with the people who, uh, who need to know in a way that it will actually stick. And that, that's more of a, uh, an issue uh, uh, the, such as the ones Lance was talking about. That's where more of the research needs to be focused right now if we're going to make a difference. Other comments? I would just I would take a contrary view for a different reason. How's Good that? deal. <laughs> I mean, just going back to the concept of integration, that there's a lot of models out there. There's, there's a lot of tools out there. In fact, really, no week goes by where I don't sit with people and listen to them talk about their tools. What I need is tools that work together. What I need is tools that integrate. I don't need a suite of tools that, you know, I, it goes back to your point of, you know, I can get five different things that tell me five different assumptions and I can't compare them. So it's really the integration where there seems to be a lot of challenges. A second area, it's not related to the energy and climate, where we do have some actual methodological issues is looking at some of the, for example, terrorism, which is obviously a very real risk to infrastructure and something that we look at. Those, that kind of modeling um, in terms of how you deal with those where you don't have frequency-based, you know, kind of data sets to work with, that's, there's a lot of ideas and a lot of people who will advance that they've solved that problem for us. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I would say third is there are some models where we would like people to go back and challenge assumptions more because what we can't afford is to be everyone uses the model because we've all decided it's the right model and then we find out that we were wrong for a lot of the reasons that you talked about, just, you know, we're just not thinking far enough in advance. So going back and challenging some of the assumptions, that's why when I talked about the fact that we use a lot of different models, we'd like to see models where they take two different perspectives on the same problem and see what answers they come up with, because then that tells us something. If they're very, very, very dissimilar answers, that tells us we need to do a lot more work before we choose either of them. So again, going back to challenge some of the assumptions. Good. Good. Anybody else? Anybody else? I, I, I think you know, one of the issues, particularly in, as it relates to energy and climate, um, it seems to me that there are two two broad areas of concern, and they're slightly disconnected. One, and, and Nick referred to it in passing this morning, is the gap between what a lot of the rest of the world has come to accept and what the entire global community of climate scientists has come to accept. You know, climate change is happening, it's man-made, it's really serious, action is desperately needed. You know, that, that's just, that's the way it is. That's not 
a matter of discussion, dispute, whatever, in much of the world. It remains a matter of discussion, dispute um, in this country. Um, and I think that's an essential problem. Part of what we're talking about today and tomorrow is um, let's accept that we need to do something. We're not even talking about the scale of what we need to do, but let's accept we need to do something. Um, how can we take a systems approach to understand um, where are the effective levers? Where can policy have the greatest impact? Where are areas that policy, perhaps, you know, people may be looking in their silos and thinking, gosh, we should really do something here. But actually, if you have a systems look at it, it really doesn't matter what you do over here. You should really be concentrating over here. And so that's part of the power I think we hope to communicate today and tomorrow. But, um, you know, there's a disconnect. You know, I, I don't know if this is kind of what you were driving at, Les, but the difference between what we know and what we don't need to know, um, there's a detailed level that we're discussing here, but there's something very, very big that actually we know, um, and yet a large part of this country act. still has to make that leap right. into knowledge. Yeah, yeah failure to act. Uh, appropriately. And the urgency. I mean, you know, right. John's bathtub, you know, if you look at those carbon concentration things, um, you know, there's an asymmetry. It's this mental model thing. Um, there's a tremendous asymmetry between the speed at which we can make things worse and the speed at which things are going to get better. Um, you know, we can stop all admission, emissions right now, globally, stop them. And that line is going to continue rising for some time to come. So, and people don't have that mental model. Good, good. Well, let me let me turn now to the audience to see if you have any questions. I know there there should be at least quite a few out there. Uh, Bob Kleinberg, uh, yeah, thank you. hold on, hold on for a microphone if you would. Uh, thank you. Uh, fascinating panel. Um, I can solve. Uh, Dr. Sturman's differential equation for the conservation of mass. Uh, I just wonder how many of my fellow citizens can and, and how many politicians are aware of it. Um, what I'd like to just throw on the table um, is sort of the, the role of psychology and emotion in these discussions. Um, at some level, people respond to rational arguments, and I think probably most people in this room respond to n n rational arguments. Most people respond to fear as a primary motivator, and the palliative of fear is the faith in a future quick fix. And, and just to take a, a, a concrete example to address Mr. Noble's point, uh, you know, you can talk about flooding uh, the entire Gulf Coast of the United States, yes, but gee, almost the entire nation of the Netherlands is below sea level, and they have compensated for that extremely well, and they're a very rich nation. We're surely, we could surely do the same thing. So it, is there a role here for worrying about sort of the psychological you know, barriers to, uh, to action? I, I don't think you're going to get anywhere without spending a lot of attention on that. Um, on the Netherlands, by the way, they are currently engaged. I, John, you may know the figure because I heard this from Bob Carell, but they're raising all of their sea defenses, I think, in other meter. Um, not at, at great, great at expense. At staggering cost. At staggering cost. And they already have those defenses. I mean, we don't have those defenses. So absolutely, you know, you can, you can find ways to solve these things, but, you know, it may make the rescue of the financial industry seem... Uh, drop in the bucket. Um, but, you know, if we, you know, part of this issue of the wicked problems about gathering all the stakeholders together and, and, and getting people to understand irreconcilable viewpoints is um, mentalities have to change. And unless we get the public engaged in this, um, you know, there's not going to be um, the drive in Washington, you know, even if you know, the president puts a lot of his capital on the line, you know, unless he can bring the public and others can bring the public along, 
you know, the change that I think most scientists believe is absolutely essential won't happen unless that psychology changes. One thing I'd add to that is we call them ostrich problems. For the exact opposite is that it's so overwhelming, so psychologically intimidating that you can't focus on any solution because it's just it's too big. Nobody has a good answer. So if there was a quick fix, I think you'd see everyone in America getting behind that. The challenge is breaking down that problem into bite-sized pieces that look that there is hope, that there is something that we can do. So identifying those solutions and doing better on not just talking about the problem, but talking about the piecemeal solutions that we can take so that it's not just dumping the problems of the world on the American people, not just dumping the problems of the world on decision makers, but turning those ostrich problems into things that we can actually tackle. Yeah, I, I completely agree about the psychological point. And, and the, the challenge with climate change in particular is that once you begin to immerse yourself in the facts of the situation, people tend to get so depressed that then they go into denial despair, there's nothing we can do, it's hopeless, uh, which is ineffective, disempowering, or denial, and that's equally uh, ineffective and leads, leads to big trouble. So the real challenge is how to, how to uh, confront people with the uh, information in a way that will motivate them to go home and uh, in, in, insulate their home uh, and uh, get out in the streets and protest for legislation and that's very tricky there's not enough work going on in, in this area people gravitate towards the quick fix a, a good analogy and I know we have some folks from Los Alamos and Sandia here so uh, people say what we need is another Manhattan Project uh, and that will solve the problem well Manhattan Project uh, ha maybe had some unintended consequences of its own <laughs> talk about that but you know it was a spectacularly successful effort the but think about how it worked right the smartest man in the world Einstein writes a personal letter to the most powerful man in the world Roosevelt says here's something we got to take a look at and just six years later with enough money and genius in the deserts of New Mexico you've got nuclear weapons People want that, and they think it's possible for the climate, but it's not. There is no way, because there was absolutely no role for the public in the Manhattan Project, couldn't be, uh, but you can't do it that way for the climate, because every single person has to change the way they consume energy, which means the way they live, how they operate their home, what kind of car they drive, and what legislation they're willing to support to create meaningful uh, limits on our emissions through some sort of price on carbon. Uh, so unless the public is engaged in this psychological issue of changing mental models is, is grappled with, there can be no progress. And it's hard. I tell the students, uh, students at MIT have blessed me with uh, a number of teaching awards, but I always feel embarrassed because I tell them on the first day of class, and I mean it quite sincerely, that I can't teach them anything. They all kind of giggle, and I say, I'm dead serious. All I can do is create an environment in which you might learn something for yourself. And it's exactly that on these issues. No amount of information is going to change anybody's mind. That cognitive approach, that white paper approach, absolutely fails on these issues. Got to create a learning environment in which people will discover these insights for themselves. And the kind of games and models that, that we've been talking about may be a piece of that puzzle. Esteban, you want to contribute to that just from your perspectives of working these multicultural issues within New Mexico? Well, I think uh, what, what John just mentioned right now is exactly correct. I mean, all, all of this um, is kind of academic if we can't get people to change their fundamental um, behaviors and, and how we communicate to the to the people that aren't part of the processes of, of evaluating this are, are key to that whole thing. Um, whether that's climate change or water management, the the difference has got to be made by individual actions of uh, of uh, of the public generally. Good. Next question, Julio. Yeah, hi, Julio Friedman, Livermore. Um, I, I have two thoughts in front of me with respect to energy solutions, which we basically already understand are trouble, and we haven't quite internalized them. So one of them was our first nascent attempt at biofuels diffusion which was the ethanol policy of 2007, which immediately created a food crisis and actually leaked carbon dioxide in the third world. And suddenly it turned out that a bunch of people who thought the biofuels were clearly net negative carbon currently say, well, we're not actually sure about the sign anymore. Um, another one was the very simple, very, very crude 
climate models that David Keith did in which he said, let's put a bunch of wind on the map and see what happens to climate and was able to demonstrate pretty conclusively that there were unintended co climate change consequences to the deployment of wind power, which really hadn't been sort of mapped or, or cautioned in any sort of substantive way. And so the, the, the question then becomes, you know, the people who were talking to this two are the people who were saying, don't give me that crap, tell me how this helps the people of Iowa. And, and we have a narrative problem of grand dimension in that we don't even understand the consequences of our solutions. And, and at this point, the only reason why we know the biofuels one is because we actually deployed it at scale. We haven't deployed any of the other solutions at scale. We don't actually know what the consequences for these things are. How do you actually engage in a substantive narrative or discussion given those kinds of boundary frameworks? Great question. Who's going to take that one on? <laughs> well, there isn't a simple answer. I mean, that's 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 the point. You know, the the notion of wicked problems. You know, one of the characteristics of a wicked problem is there's no immediate and no ultimate test of a solution. Um, you know, it it becomes an iterative process and you know you only find solutions they're not true or false they're better or worse and you know, as you move along you adjust that and you hope you get better and better on it um, you know it's it's a difference in a way between I mean maybe this is unfair there are engineers in the room, but you know there's an engineering approach you know which is we're going to have a kind of linear um, path to a desired future, but the reality is going to be what I would call more of a design approach. We're going to have a very nonlinear path, but if we can get agreement, and this is where the psychology comes in and where the power of narrative, I think, matters, if we can get agreement on what that desired future is, the path is going to be nonlinear. We're going to adjust it at all sorts of various times because you know, we're going to iterate and we're going to prototype and, and all that and, and adjust on the basis of that experience. But, you know, we'll get to, if we can get agreement on what that desired future is, we'll get there. But, um, you know, there isn't a way to test it. That's the nature of these incredibly wicked problems. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. I was just going to add that it also puts us in a real bind as in terms of informing decision makers because people come to us with solutions and if they turn out not to be right, then credibility is lost. And that's something that we actually see a lot with, um, particularly like our state partners, we're having a real hard time with that right now, in terms of, you know, if you tell your bosses one thing and then you turn out to be wrong, you can't go back to that trough again. So it's, it's imperative in terms of everyone's frustrated with how slowly things move, but there's also a reason that things move slowly and that's because if we don't get it right, we lose a lot of capital doing in the process. So. It's one of the reasons that we do things the way we do. One of the reasons that makes sense for why we do the, what we do. I think we've got to be a lot less worried about being, being right or wrong here. I mean, if you think about complex systems like uh, flying a new aircraft, uh, there's continual iteration between the uh, real world of a test pilot in the, in the actual craft and the virtual world of the simulator. Simulators are models and they're imperfect. You do the best you can in them, but then you got to go up in the real thing. And you use what you learn there from near misses and unfortunately from the occasional accident to improve the simulators and the training and the briefing so that it gets better over time. And that's different from, I, you know, I was wrong, okay, great, we can't go back there. No, that's not the way it works. The way it works is we learn something, we're going to make it better for the next time. That attitude is missing in a lot of the policy discussions, uh, and, and we need to get there. And, and the other thing to remember is people are going to be using models no matter what. Uh, you know, you get a call, you need an eight-hour response, a model will be used, even if uh, it's a completely bogus model. Uh, a very fast story, in, in the Carter administration, I worked at DOE for a brief period developing dynamic models of energy policy. I was a lowly graduate student at the time, the very bottom of the food chain. Uh, we get a call one day, my Uber boss, uh, Senator X wants to know what the impact on his state of the natural gas deregulation bill is going to be, and we need to know tomorrow because we got to get his vote. Uh, well, there was no model that gave a state-level view. So what do you think we did? We made it up. 
Yep. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> had we had a little bit more time than half an hour, we might have gone to an atlas, uh, which was on paper, and figured out the population oh. divided by the per capita share. <laughs> but absolutely. So a model will be used. It's not a question of right or wrong. It's can you somehow design a process that's going to lead to better models and better impact for the models we've got. Good. Esteban? In the context of, of the uh, endangered species uh, work that, that I've been on, uh, it, we've been mo moving towards adaptive, uh, adaptive management type biological opinions, which presumably, and we'll, we'll see whether this actually ends up working that way, but which presumably allows us to learn from our mistakes and keep making adjustments in a better direction. But um, I think it is something that we all take a wait and see approach to the whole thing. Good. Other questions? Yeah, John Kelly. Hi, thank you. John Kelly representing the Galvin Electricity Initiative. Uh, Mr. Bob Galvin, I'd like to say he is amazed that this workshop is actually going on within the government of the United States right now because I think what, what you've all brought out on this panel is, is that systems thinking from a business perspective, if you talk to Mr. Galvin, every business, they fail, they fail fast. They're testing, they're prototyping, they're, they're, their life is on the line always, and the good businesses are using systems thinking and quality and working with you, Dr. Sturman, on new solutions and systems thinking. And, and I think you brought it up. Look at energy efficiency. Look at renewables. Look at oil independence. We've tried this over the last 30 years how many times? And now we put carbon on the table, and we're going to use the same methods that we've applied for 30 years that have not succeeded. From our perspective, I would say the Galvin Initiative, which is trying to transform the electricity industry, this is it. Quality methods and systems thinking have been the way that industries have survived year after year. The ones that don't use it die. You look at Ford right now, it's because Mullally implemented quality methods when he got to Ford. And his, his quality is what it's all about, systems thinking quality. They didn't take stimulus. They're moving in a different direction than GM and Chrysler, who did not, who lost their quality way in their systems thinking. So business and government are no different. This is the solution. And I think the challenge for everyone the rest of today and tomorrow is how does this become relevant? Uh, how does this team take themselves out of another part of what I'd call in the system design is conflict of interest? Uh, I've spent a lot of time in energy efficiency. I helped form the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance in Illinois. What happened to energy efficiency is they need money. They go lobby for dollars. They get dollars, the utilities get the money, the energy efficiency companies get the money, and everyone seems to be happy, yet there's been no systems thinking applied. There's no real change in the industry. Life goes on. So I think our challenge, there are huge challenges for this group, but I think this is it right here in the room. If it's going to happen, if it's going to be meaningful, uh, it'll come from here, and I don't think anywhere else. So how, how do we become relevant, the systems thinkers? How, how do we get to the table? Comments on that? You know, just just a related uh, comment coming back to this whole notion of learning. Um, I think it's related to what John just was referring to. How do you really promulgate that longer term so it's sustainable, enduring, and you continue to make progress? Uh, and and it manifests itself in such a way that you make you, you're able to transition through different administrations, different congresses, different politics, etc economic times and others. Comment on that? Yeah, well, so uh, <laughs> education is terribly important here of the, uh, the younger people starting in uh, elementary school, I believe, and there is work going on to teach elementary school kids systems thinking, and many of them do amazingly well intuitively. You know, uh, you hit your little sister, what's she going to do? She's going to hit you back. Uh, <laughs> What kind of a feedback loop is that? Well, my kids learned a long time ago that's a positive feedback loop, and they, uh, I don't know that it changed their behavior, but at least they understand, <laughs> at least they understand what's going to happen when they hit their sibling. Uh, and all the way up, and it really does make a difference. In the business world, we see that, yep, businesses fail, and, and people move around an awful lot, and uh, the company may 
fail, but the people who pursued systems thinking tend to prosper in their careers. They tend to do well, not always, plenty of failures, uh, but uh, they'll go somewhere else and, and, uh, and do something else that works and move the ball forward down the field and it starts to accumulate. That's what we've got to do. Now, the problem is we don't have time on the climate issue. We have to do that. We must do that also. You know, there's an old story in every religious tradition. Uh, if you know the Messiah is coming today, you still plant the tree first. Uh, so we still need to plant those trees. But meanwhile, uh, we've got to find ways to get at the uh, policy issues uh, today. Good. Good. We had a question here in the front with Nick Maybe. And then one in the back, why don't we go with Joel first so you don't have to walk quite so far. Um, you talk about systems, well, markets are also systems. And when you think about some of the successes we've had, they've been uh, as a result of market uh, mechanisms, maybe, impartial, uh, maybe, in, maybe partially, maybe, maybe full market systems. I mean, we got lead out of gasoline using market systems. We uh, have essentially cleaned up uh, uh, acid rain as a result of uh, uh, market mechanisms. We've raised the price of cigarettes. That's cut back in terms of usage and with a lot of uh, good uh, uh, repercussions. So in this context, there are a lot of me market mechanisms. They decentralize the problem. They allow people to make their own decisions in terms of how they solve the problem. They don't make big bets. They make a lot of small bets. And um, I, I guess I'm just asking from that perspective, aside from the obvious ones like cap and trade, are, are there other market mechanisms that might be applied and that might accelerate this whole process because they change from the big overarching multi-billion dollar uh, decision making that has to go on to micro decision making? Anybody want to take that? So I, I fear I'm taking too much airtime here, but uh, you know, as a professor in a school of management and someone who was trained in economics, I have great sympathy to your comment, and there is a tremendously important role for markets uh, when they work. And what all the examples you described, uh, it wasn't just the market doing it. It was regulation and government policy which put into place price-based approaches to m overcoming market failure. So taxing cigarettes, uh, the uh, cap and trade program for SO2, et cetera, they all involved uh, the role of government to, uh, to correct a market failure that the market was not able to overcome on its own. Uh, but you're absolutely right that when it's appropriate uh, to unleash the power of the market to stimulate innovation, to motivate people and present the proper incentives, we've got to do it that way and command and control won't work. The problem is that for uh, climate change in particular, climate change has been described correctly, I believe, as the greatest market failure in history. It's got all the elements that markets can't deal with. Tremendous uncertainty, very long time delays so that short-run actions uh, that you take, you don't bear the costs of those. They're borne by other people in future generations. So you have a tragedy of the commons uh, or a common good problem uh, that's uh, on a scale never before seen. Uh, and, and so uh, the market by itself isn't going to solve that problem. However, putting the correct price for carbon in front of people will encourage people to make decisions that are in their own best interest, which they probably know better than anybody else. So put the price of gasoline up to its correct true level, which is at least $10 a gallon right now today. Those costs are real. You don't pay for them at the pump, but you pay for them in the flooding that's going to happen in the defense budget today, in the lung disease and other health problems that come from the pollution caused by uh, excessive consumption of fossil fuels and gasoline, and on and on and on and on. So yes, let's get those prices right and let the market do what it can do right. But the market won't get those prices right on its own. Only government and public policy can do that. And I, I think the, the one thing I would add to that is I think it's, it's encouraging, um, I mean, we'll see what happens, but some of the influence um, there seems to be in policy thinking in this administration from behavioral economics, I think, could also have 
um, significant impact here. You know, we, we've talked in the room about changing psychology and changing people's behavior. And it may well be that you know there are policy nudges, um, you know, to use the Vogue phrase, you know, that will help, you know, encourage people to use more insulation or to uh, cut down their commuting or whatever it may be. So I, I think there are a number of um, economic policy tools and, and market-based tools that will be useful. But you know, as John says, you know, we, we really do have a tragedy of the commons here. I would, I would just add that it's something that we think about a lot in terms of incentivization of certain behaviors. And we look at it from our infrastructure protection community that we have is largely private owned. So we actually don't have, other than those places where we have regulation, there's very narrow areas where we do have regulation. The, that other than those places that we have a, a challenge, we have to convince people to do something that's against their bottom line in the interest of the nation. And that's a real challenge. So going back to how we incentivize, I think that's going back to systems analysis in general, it's that kind of analysis that we use to help make the case. And that's, the, that's where we see our role, is helping make the case to our owners and operators, to our communities, to our states, to take those actions. And that's where this analysis becomes so powerful. And I liked your point about the visual aspect of it, because oftentimes we're explaining this to people who aren't going to understand the math. In fact, they're really, really not going to understand the math. So being able to translate it into something that's a persuasive message is something that's incredibly important, because we have to make the case for them to do something that otherwise would be against their best interest. And we've been able to use the analysis to help put things into perspective for them, a perspective that they find compelling to do what we, what we need them to do. Good. I reserved one last question, I believe. Nick? It was just coming back to the kind of so many message on intentional change and how do we actually move forward? And just, you know, we talked about several things, institutions. Um, yeah, the Climate Change Committee in the UK is quite a radical institutional innovation to, to provide a space for challenge, the, to a bipartisan agreement on climate change to actually deliver. Incentives for people to come forward with riskier solutions or use system approaches. I mean, we were given permission to go and annoy everybody in government. We have an incentive from the cabinet, and we had personal incentives that fitted with that. Most permanent civil servants didn't when we tried that in another place. People were very careful about who they were going to challenge with new ideas because um, and last one, communities of action. I mean, we tried to build communities who own the problems differently. And you know, whether it was peace builders in the peace building sp space or the security community on climate change, quite powerful. I think the lesson from Europe of trying to do this for a decade across the whole of Europe, and I can tell you lots of examples, is don't put off the institutional change. Really don't. Honestly, don't try to do it. In a, you, know, you need to do bigger changes than you think about how you operate and how you incentivize people in government and the parastatal apparatus. To, to do things, and it's just fooling yourself if you think it's going to be business as usual. And the question would be, you know, if you were God or Obama, sometimes difficult to tell <laughs> from, the, your, you, from the Europe, you know, the difference, you know, what would be your one big institutional change or incentive change for the government to deal with the issue of climate change? You know, I mean, just, no, no, it's not as a public servant, but just really that, again, what would that structural shift be? Because this is the time you can get stuff done on those bases. If you leave it for a few years, everybody's far too busy. So what would be your, your killer change institutionally? Well, let's just start with uh, that end. Lance, would you offer your opinion? <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, you know, one of the curiosities of the American system, I'm sure you're well aware, Nick, is, you know, although the president is the most powerful man on earth, in terms of changing things, not least institutionally, he has a lot less power than a prime minister. Um, so I think that's an incredibly daunting question. Um, I think somehow, um, and I don't know what the institutional design for this is, there needs to be um, something at the center of government um, you know, in the executive uh, in this country where everything to do with this climate energy nexus is brought together and can actually take executive action. You know, I think one of the real barriers to getting change is that we have such a split you know, series of silos. You know, Steve Chu is incredibly aware of certainly the science and, and the desperate need for action. 
and the energy department has a good voice in this, but you know, the energy department budget is in the context of the national budget relatively small. You know, the Department of Defense has many, 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 many times that budget and could potentially have a huge impact and they're off doing their thing. And so you have all these different, so if, if somehow, and it's in the American context, I think it's fantasy, if you could somehow, you know, concentrate power on this huge cross-cutting issue, it would be a lovely institutional change. Esteban? <laughs> I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fair, that's fair. Christine? Yeah, I'm gonna take the fifth on the answer, but um, one thing I will say is, just going back to the comment I made earlier about integrating where things stand relative to one another across the entire, ish, the entire risk landscape is essential that if you look at things in silos, you're going to get answers in silos, you're going to get budgets in silos, you're going to get everything in structures in silos. So integrating and looking at a risk landscape from a national perspective across all hazards, and probably an international perspective since many systems are global, that looking at things, integrating that so we have one risk landscape would be helpful. So I'm gonna uh, turn it around a little. I. I Centralized uh, approaches have not worked in, in a number of other cases in the past. So just to give one example, and it may be a little controversial, but I really don't think so. After 9-11, we created the, uh, the ODNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the explicit purpose of, w purpose of which was to get the now 16 intelligence uh, agencies to actually share information. We had all the pieces. We couldn't put it together prior to the attack. Uh, it hasn't worked, uh, not in terms of attacks, but you talk to the people in the community, at least the ones that I have talked to, and uh, they will tell you we still hate all those other guys just as much as before, and there's enormous problems breaking down those silos. Now, that doesn't mean it was, um, uh, it didn't have any benefits, but, but creating the DNI hasn't met its avowed purpose, and so creating a centralized uh, climate czar, I doubt, will work. And, and I'm not saying there's no role for institutional change, but I don't think that's the real locus of power here. My model of change on this is uh, it's not a Manhattan Project situation that can be dictated by the president or anybody else. It's much more like the civil rights movement. And, uh, and the reason for that is nobody, no, no president, uh, it, no legislature, no Congress, no prime minister is really going to be able to put into place the policies that are consistent with the science uh, unless there's sufficient public support. Otherwise, as you say, they have to use all their political capital to do it. And on this issue, there's not enough political capital in the world uh, to do this uh, because future generations don't vote, uh, but SUV drivers do, some of them. Uh, so it's the civil rights movement. And power uh, grew up uh, organically and was put in the hands of the leaders that emerged organically from the tens of thousands of people who stood up at PTA meetings and in churches and synagogues around this country and said segregation is wrong and we're willing to march and we're willing to vote and we're willing to put our dollars behind that and this is the thing we're standing up for and that's got to happen in this country before we're going to get where we need to go. Yes, Great. So I've, so the, 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 the comment is extremely apt, right? People could see, you didn't need a computer model to know that segregation was immoral and racism is wrong. You could just see it uh, if your eyes were open. Uh, and so this is harder because we're talking about what's gonna happen and somewhere else, uh, not uh, what's happening in my town or my state or in my country. Uh, so it's a bigger challenge, but that just means we've got to work harder. Well, the time has come. Uh, I've gotten the nod from Terry that we should really bring this session to a close. It was really our intent to provide each of you who come from this, these, these sets of problems from very different places and have a consistent framework and a basis of understanding about the terminology around systems analysis and to illustrate through some specific and diverse examples as to how it can actually be used to inform decision making and ultimately policy formulation in the future. And on behalf of myself, Terry, and others, I'd like to just thank each of the panelists one more time for their contributions.